On the last day of February, 1910, rain was falling on the west slope of Washington's Cascade Mountains, which, along with Chinook winds that were melting the snow, was causing rivers to swell. While the rest of the state prepared for flooding, high up in the Cascade Mountains, a passenger train had been stalled by heavy snows the week before. When the people on that train went to bed that night, they had reason to hope that the tracks would finally be cleared the next day. They were, apparently, completely unaware of the disaster to come. The Great Northern Railway was once the northernmost transcontinental railroad route in the United States. Its transcontinental route ran from St. Paul, Minnesota to Seattle, Washington, crossing the rugged Cascade Mountains from Spokane to Seattle over 4,000-foot Stevens Pass, named after John Frank Stevens, a famous civil engineer with the Great Northern Line who, in 1905, became chief engineer on the Panama Canal. Among his projects with the Great Northern was the 2.6-mile-long Cascade Tunnel, constructed between 20 August 1897 and 20 December 1900. Previously, the rail line had used switchbacks to carry trains over Stevens Pass, but the tunnel had been constructed to avoid problems caused by heavy snow across the eight zigzagging switchbacks. The Spokane Chronicle quoted Stevens on September 19, 1900. It will save miles of road besides the extra expense of carrying the trains over the mountain. The tunnel has taken little less than three years in building. The newspaper reckoned that when the piece of engineering work is finished, it will probably be the second longest tunnel in America. A small railroad town called Wellington, the location of a depot, was founded at the west end of the tunnel in 1893. The Rushville, Indiana Republican said of Wellington, The town is one of the wildest mountain sections of Washington, being in the valley of Stevens Pass at the foot of Mount Howard's. Rich gold, silver, copper, and iron mines surrounded the little town. The Cascade Tunnel of the Great Northern emerges from the mountains at this point, and during midwinter season, falls of snow frequently handicap railroad traffic. Great drifts blocking and stalling trains for days at a time. While the tunnel did cut distance from the route and replace the treacherous switchbacks, snow continued to be a problem. On February 20th, 1910, a significant storm struck across the Pacific Northwest. The Spokane Washington Spokesman Review noted on the 21st that heavy snow in Montana had delayed many trains of the Great Northern and Northern Pacific lines from three to five hours. But, the paper reports, one of the worst storms of the year raged in the Cascades last night and yesterday afternoon, threatening to tie up traffic on the Great Northern Line. The paper reported that the rotaries, giant engine-mounted plows that used circular blades, kept the tracks clear west of the Cascade Tunnel. But the storm continued to rage. The Tacoma Times reported on the 26th that the snow blockade on the Great Northern Railroad grows worse each hour instead of better. The heavy snow fell all night in the mountains, completely wiping out what little work had been done to close the tracks. The paper noted that the six stalled passenger trains are standing today in the same spots they have been blocked for three days. The Bellingham Washington Herald wrote on the 27th, with rain falling on the west slope of the Cascade Mountains and heavy snow slides near the crest of the range, the northern transcontinental railroads tonight are facing the worst difficulties they have ever experienced in the operation of trains this year. The Northern Pacific, which is the only transcontinental road that has been able to operate trains through the Cascades for nearly a week, suffered severely from snow slides today. Noting that the dining cars and all Northern Pacific trains are carrying extra stocks of provisions in order to withstand a siege in the mountains, the paper reported that three eastbound trains are held in the mountains, but it is expected that they will be released later tonight. On the 28th, the Seattle Star reported that the snow has finally stopped in the mountains today, but Great Northern officials refuse to predict when the track will be cleared. Rotaries are working on both sides of the Cascade Tunnel today. The Tacoma Times reported that day that all but one of the passenger trains stalled in the Cascades on the Great Northern have run the blockade today. The one remaining train is Spokane Local West, which has been stalled near Wellington since the 24th. The paper stressed that the passengers were safe. There is a diner on the train and supplies are hauled daily over the snow, but, but what was first an enjoyable experience for the 30 passengers on board has become monotonous after five days. Later reports said that some passengers had grown impatient and walked from Wellington to the next stop, a small place with a hotel called Scenic Hot Springs. The night of the 28th, the telegram lines cut and Wellington lost communication with the world. But the rest of the passengers remained on train number 25, along with a fast mail train, number 27, carrying no passengers, plus numerous great northern workers involved in clearing the tracks.
Still, the passengers must have seen, both figuratively and literally, light at the end of the tunnel, as the snow had stopped and rain was falling. On the train, Mrs. M. A. Coverton of Seattle was on her way to celebrate her golden wedding anniversary, and Mrs. Stewart of British Columbia was returning from Spokane, where her husband had been killed in a railroad accident in July. John Gray, his wife, and foster child were returning from a visit to his wife's sister in Pomeroy, Washington. The Victoria British Columbia Times reported that Charles Andrew, an engineer on the fast mail train who was sleeping aboard the train, was awakened from a sound sleep at one o'clock in the morning of March 1st. He lay still for a few minutes, unable to go back to sleep. The mental impression of impending disaster was so strong that he finally walked to the bunkhouse in Wellington, where the other men were sleeping, and sat down on the steps alone. A few minutes later, there was a rumble, then a roar, and then the earth shook, and the flying particles of snow cut off his view. And when it settled, where the trains had been a few minutes before, nothing remained. Mr. Gray recalled, We had all retired for the night, but not to sleep, as everyone seemed to expect the awful disaster. We were lying quietly when we heard the terrible crashing, and in a moment it was upon us. I cannot describe the sensation, but I could easily remember the funny noise of the cringing snow for a hundred years, were I to live that long. My wife held me, and I had the baby close in my arms. The Lincoln, Nebraska Daily Star wrote, Shortly before two o'clock, Tuesday morning, when everyone on the two trains sidetracked at Wellington was sleeping, ten acres of the mountainside that towered above the trains became detached, and taking with it snow, trees, earth, and rocks, an avalanche plunged down into the canyon. The trains were picked up as if they were trifles, and the whole mass was piled at the bottom of the ravine, several hundred feet below. The New Orleans Time Democrat wrote that the snow slide at Wellington is about one mile in width, reaching from the water tower south of Wellington to the first snow shed. The equipment carried down the steep slope included a rotary snow plow with a full crew, all of whom slept in a bunk home aboard the huge machine. Gray said suddenly all was tumult around us, and the car was crushed, as you might crush a cigar box with a sledgehammer, and it seemed as though we were shot through the roof of the car. It was then my wife was torn away from me, but I still had the baby fast in my arms. Our car burst stayed with us to the last, but something got between the child and me, and I had to let go. I was pinned on all sides. I felt my leg was caught in something and broken. Something was shoved hard in my back, and my head and right arm were fast. I thought my arm would break at any moment. Attempts to rescue the trapped people started almost immediately. The Daily Times quoted Vaughn Ellis, who had been among the first who, hearing of the accident, came from Sydney Cot Springs. The slide struck the train at 1.43 a.m. on Tuesday. The watch belonging to an engineer was found dented and stopped at that time. Some tell of the awful roar of the avalanche, but no one was awakened at the hotel at Wellington. Alfred B. Hensel, a mail clerk, was thrown through a window of his car and hurled far ahead of the wreck. In his night robes, he struggled back up the canyon and awoke the sleeping people in the hotel. Immediately came the cry, everybody out! Then indeed everybody was out. 150 men rushed to their shovels and flew to the rescue. The Daily Star wrote that Hensel, the mail clerk, had a fractured collarbone and a broken arm. But still he could count himself lucky. Of eight mail clerks on the fast mail train, he was the only survivor. The star continues that Brakeman, Duncan, and conductors Purcell and Clary, who were in one of the cars that was smashed to splinters, escaped with slight bruises. In bare feet, they worked for hours, helping the injured and those caught under the wreckage. But many great northern employees did not escape. The Wilmington, Delaware Morning News reported that in addition to the passengers, 30 workmen who had been engaged in the battle against the drifts that had been holding the trains imprisoned in the mountains since February 24th were sleeping in the day coaches. But the Daily Star wrote that the day coach and smoker have not been found. They were smashed as completely as though tons of iron had fallen on them. The Fall River, Massachusetts Daily News quoted a great northern section hand named Ed Clark, who was among the first to reach the wrecked train. It was thundering and lightning when we ran out after the avalanche. It was dark as pitch when the lightning didn't blind us. We heard a faint moaning down the gulch and made a break for it. There were only two or three little railroad lanterns for light, and all around us we could hear trees snapping and other slides tumbling down. We stumbled and rolled down into the gully. We could hear the cries. Some had grabbed up axes, and when they ran out, and then the lanterns showed a row of hands beckoning in every little hole and opening in the coaches, we started chopping between the outstretched hands, so began to take them out. We got some of them out, but many died before we got to them, although they were living when we reached the spot. 
Ella said of the scene away up in the summit of the Cascade Mountains, today there is spread out all the evidence of the most horrible catastrophe ever recorded in the history of the Northwest. There's no sign of a wreck. There's no piled up cars or overturned engines. All you can see is snow with scattered stumps and branches of trees. And away down beneath the mass, 40 to 50 feet below, is the splintered debris of two trains, three engines, four motor cars, and a superintendent's car. Occasionally you would hear a groan underneath the snow, and then the shovels fairly flew to the rescue. But it was not always a living person that the sturdy arms passed out. Many times it wasn't even a whole body. More often just a leg or an arm or even a head. Out of the first pile of splinters and snow came four bodies, unidentified, but strange to say the next four came out of the same pile, were very much alive, and proceeded to walk to Scenic immediately. Fireman F.A. Bates, on the engine of train number 27, the mail train, told the Daily Times, I was under my engine five hours, was snowing hard and piling up around my head and hands. Twice I gave up and said, it's all off, but then the rescuers came. The Daily Star wrote that one woman was rescued from a Pullman after 12 hours in a prison of snow. News of the disaster and the need for help had still not reached the wider world. The New Orleans Times Democrat wrote that a messenger was dispatched at once to help. The first news of the disaster was brought by John Wenzel of Wellington. He staggered into Skykomish, 18 miles from Wellington, and gasped out his story. He was so exhausted from his long fight against the snow that it was several hours before he could give a coherent story. Bit by bit, Wenzel's disjointed utterances were placed together into a connected narrative. The avalanche came without warning. Wenzel, who was at W.H. Ballant's hotel, ran out to see the billows of snow settling over the tracks where the train had stood. Later, Wenzel saw men carrying women and children from the partly buried coaches, which had been carried down the side of the gulch. He thought that eight women and children were carried out while he looked on. Some of them moaned, and he knew, therefore, they were living. Gray had lost track of his wife and assumed that she was dead. But the child was yet within reach of my left hand, and yet the poor little fellow kept crying, Papa! Papa! Feeling with his hand, he found that a piece of glass had stuck in the child's head. He managed to pull it out with his fingers. I arranged the pillow so that he would be more comfortable and not choke him. He cried piteously for a long time and then sobbed to sleep. The rescuers faced formidable difficulties. The morning news wrote that the great tree trunks that were carried down by the snow are entangled with the wreckage of the cars and other equipment and make it difficult to get at the bodies. Frequently, when an opening is made in the side of a car, the snow rushes in the hole and retards the work of rescue. The Daily Star wrote that the rescuers themselves are in a perilous position, for the danger from snowslide is not over. Warm winds, accompanied by frequent showers, are working havoc with the loose snow, which is 18 feet deep on the level, and frequently avalanches are seen shooting down the steep slopes. Several men, on leaving the sites of Hoare at Wellington and arriving at Scenic, at the nearest relief station, were unable to describe what they had seen. The perils of their descent of the mountains and the cries of the wounded and the wreckage below the track had made them hysterical. Looking down today at the debris of the avalanche, the cars are not in sight. They are under 40 or 50 feet of snow and trees. One glance at the ruins explains why so many persons are missing and given no hope that any of those buried are alive. 150 men, mostly volunteers, are working to uncover the dead, but they accomplish little, their task being so great owing to the vast mass of debris under which the cars are buried. To add to the difficulties of the situation, the only wires from Scenic went down last night. Help slowly arrived. A great northern superintendent personally led a group of doctors and nurses to Wellington on snowshoes. The railroad bunkhouse in Wellington was turned into a makeshift hospital. Remains were buried in the snow, marked with a rough board until train service was restored and they could be removed. Ninety-six people were killed. It was the deadliest avalanche in U.S. history but 33 were saved. Among the survivors were John Gray, his wife, and their adopted child. All three were pulled alive from the wreckage some 12 hours after the avalanche, although all three were seriously injured. Gray told the Bellingham Herald that I never heard anything sound so good as the rotary whistle, apprising us that the road had been opened again and we could get out of that place. The residents of the tiny town of Wellington, Washington, couldn't bear to have their town name tied to such a terrible disaster. They renamed the town Ty the following year. In 1929, a new railroad tunnel was built, and with the railroad no longer going through, the town was abandoned. Today, you can visit the ghost town of Wellington, Washington, on the U.S. Forest Service-maintained Iron Goat Trail. 
I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community at Locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 